Chapter Twelve of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, Aunt Jane. Peter approached the shanty boat cautiously, but there was no sign of danger. Indeed, finding Buddy gone, the five men who had come to the boat were quite satisfied to get booze. Four were but little interested in helping Briggles pick up a small boy, and nobody wanted Peter, but Booge, being a tramp and having assaulted a bearer of a court order, was a desirable capture. Booge, when he felt reasonably sure Peter had reached safety, ended his half-joking parley abruptly and said he was willing to accompany his captors in peace. He was satisfied he would not be given much more than six months in the county jail for the assault, and six months would carry him through the winter into good, warm summer weather. There was nothing to be gained by a struggle against five men except more trouble. Once more in his cabin, Peter put Buddy to bed in the dark and ate his much-delayed supper. Buddy seemed to take the flight as a matter of no moment. Flights, he probably thought, were a part of every small boy's life, and he dropped asleep the moment he was tucked in the bunk. Peter, however, did not sleep. He had much to think over. When an hour had elapsed, he lighted his lamp, knowing it could not be seen from any distance, and set to work preparing to leave the boat forever. He had few portable belongings worth carrying away. What food was left he made into a parcel. He cut, with his jackknife, strips from one of his blankets to wind about his legs and sliced off other pieces in which to tie his feet, for his shoes were thin and worn through in places. He cut a hole in the center of what was left of the blanket, making a serape of it for Buddy. Later he cut a similar hole in the other blanket for himself. All Buddy's toys he stored away under the bunk with his shotgun. Then he baked a corn cake and stowed pieces of it in his pockets. He was ready for his flight. His sister Jane should afford a refuge for him and the boy. Long before sunrise he awakened Buddy and fed him, ate his own breakfast, tied his feet in the pieces of blanket, and left the shanty boat. They were two strange objects as Peter worked his way down the slough, taking care to avoid the snow patches and keeping to that part of the ice blown clear by the wind. Peter had dressed Buddy and himself for comfort and not for show. The blue serape enveloped Buddy and hung below his feet as Peter carried him, and both Peter and Buddy had strips of blanket tied over their heads to protect their ears. Peter, in his own gray blanket, tied about the waist with same twine, looked like an untidy friar, his feet huge gray paws. A quarter of a mile below the shanty boat, Peter turned and crossed the island, and, issuing on the other side, the whole broad river lay before him. It was still dark as he began his long tramp across the river, and on the vast field of ice, it was frigidly cold. There the wind had a clearer sweep than in the protected slough, and one could understand why Peter had risked the return of the boat for additional garments, after having once fled from it. The wind carried the snow in low white clouds, lifting it from one drift to deposit it in another, piling it high against every obstruction on the ice. Without their blanket serapes, it would have been impossible for Peter, hardened as he was, to withstand the cold of the long journey he had planned. For a quarter of a mile, after leaving the island, Peter had to struggle over the rough hummocks that had been drift ice until the river closed, but beyond that the going was smoother. In places the ice was so glassy that he could not walk, but had to slide his feet along without lifting them. The wind cut his face like a knife, and the blowing snow gathered on his eyelashes, and Buddy grew heavier and heavier in his arms. 
he could have carried him all day pick-a-back but he did not dare risk that mode lest he slip and fall backward on the little fellow his arms and back ached with a strain but still he kept on making straight across the river and not until he had passed the middle did he set buddy down then believing he was beyond the jurisdiction of an iowa court order he rested sitting flat on the ice with buddy in his lap i can walk uncle peter said buddy uncle peter will carry you a while yet buddy said peter by and by when he gets tired again he'll let you walk uncle peter is in a hurry now he lifted the boy again and plodded on and when he reached the roughly wooded illinois shore he pushed in among the grapevine festooned trees until he was well hidden from the river. There he made a fire and rested until he and Buddy were warmed through. Then out upon the river again and, keeping close to the bank, upstream. Here he was sheltered from the cutting wind and the walking was surer, for the sand had blown upon the ice in many places but his progress was slow for all that. About noon he halted again and made a fire and ate, and then went on. Toward four o'clock, coming abreast of a tall, lightning-scarred sycamore, Peter plunged into the brush until he came to a clearing on the edge of a small slough. Here stood an old log cattle shed, and here, with a fire burning on the dirt floor, they spent the night. Buddy huddled in Peter's arms, with his back to the fire. They had covered half the distance to River Bank. "'Where are we going now, Uncle Peter?' asked Buddy the next morning. "'I guess we won't go nowhere today,' said Peter. "'We ain't likely to be bothered here this time of the year, so we'll just make a good fire and stay right here and be comfortable.' and tonight we're going to start over across to your Aunt Jane's house. "'Is Aunt Jane's house like this house?' asked Buddy. "'Well, it's quite considerable better,' said Peter. "'You'll see what it's like when you get to it. If everything turns out the way I hope it will, you and me will live at Aunt Jane's quite some time.' Not until well toward nine o'clock did Peter awaken Buddy that night. He was haunted by the fear that, once he touched Iowa soil, every eye would be watching for him and every hand eager to tear Buddy from him. If, however, he could get Buddy safely into Jane's care, Peter believed he could make a fight against Briggles or any other man. For Jane's house was a home. There was a woman in it. Peter meant to time his trip to reach Jane's in the early morning. The moon was full and bright, glaring bright on the river, as Peter started, and the cold was benumbing. The long diagonal course across the river brought Peter and Buddy to the Iowa shore some three miles below River Bank, just before sunrise. On shore new difficulties met him. A road ran along the shore, but Peter's destination lay straight back in the hills, and two miles of sandy farmland in frozen furrows, crossed by many barbed wire fences, lay between Peter and the foot of the hills. The sun came up while he was still struggling across the plowed land, and by the time he reached the road that led up the hillside, it was glaring day. Twice early farmers, bound to town, passed him as he trudged along the winding road, staring at him curiously, and Peter dropped to the creek bed that followed the road. Here he could hide if he heard an approaching team. Just below his sister's house the road crossed the creek, and here Peter climbed the bank. A wind had risen with the sun and Peter's blanket flapped against his legs. At his sister's gate he paused behind a mass of leafless elderberry bushes and deposited Buddy on the low bank that edged the road. "'Now you stay right here, Buddy,' said Peter to the boy, 
and just sort of look at the landscape over there whilst i run up and tell your aunt jane you're coming she don't like to be surprised but i don't want to look at the landscape uncle peter buddy complained i want to go with you it ain't much of a landscape and that's a fact said peter glancing at the bare clay bank across the creek and if it wasn't very important that i should speak to your aunt jane first i wouldn't ask you to wait here i know just how a boy feels about waiting my goodness did i see a squirrel over there a little gray squirrel with a big bushy tail no said buddy well you just keep a sharp eye on that clay bank and maybe you will maybe you'll see a little jumpy rabbit i don't want to see a rabbit i want to go with you said buddy peter looked at the house it was hardly more than a weather-beaten shanty its fence once an army of white pickets was now but a tumble-down affair of rotting posts and stringers with a loose picket here and there and the dooryard was cluttered with tin cans and wood ashes the woodshed as free from paint as the house was well filled with stove wood for peter had filled it in the early fall beyond the woodshed the garden peter worked it for his sister each spring was indicated by the rows of cabbage stalks with their few frozen leaves still clinging to them the whole place was run down and slipshod but it was a house and it held a woman goodness me said peter of course you don't want to look for rabbits i've got that jackknife i bought for you right here in my pocket and now i guess you'll want to wait here for uncle peter you will if uncle peter opens the big blade and gets you a stick to whittle i want to whittle said buddy promptly i want to whittle a funny cat peter looked about for a stick there he said there's a stick but if i was you i'd make a funny snake out of it that stick don't look like it would make a cat you make a snake and if it don't turn out to be a snake maybe it'll be a sword now you stay right here and uncle peter won't be gone very long i'm going to put you right back in among these bushes and don't you move i won't said buddy when peter left the shanty boat he had felt that he could walk up to jane with the front of a lion and demand shelter for himself and for buddy all the advantages of a home from that distance it had seemed quite reasonable for he owned the house and the small plot of ground on which it stood ownership ought to give some rights and he had planned just what he would say he would tell jane he had come then he would tell her he had reformed and how he had reformed and that he was a changed man and was going to work hard and make things comfortable for her and give up shanty boating and the river and all the things he had loved he would say he now saw all these were bad for his character then when she got used to that he would incidentally mention buddy and tell her what a nice little fellow he was and what a steadying effect the boy would have on his shiftless life then he would get buddy and his sister would see what a fine boy buddy was and wrap her arms around him and weep peter was sure she would weep and there would be a home for buddy with a woman in it but if jane objected as she might peter meant to set his foot down hard it was his house and he could do what he wished with it that he had allowed jane to possess it in a single piece was well enough but it was his house that would bring her to time it the nearer he had approached the house however the more doubtful he had become that jane would welcome him and that she would after a little talk order him to bring buddy in the closer he came to jane the better he recalled the many times he had fled precipitately after doing her chores and his many moist and mournful receptions now he walked to the kitchen door and knocked 
and Jane's voice bade him enter. He took off his hat as he entered. His sister was sitting at the kitchen table where, despite the lateness of the hour, she had evidently just finished her breakfast. As she turned her head, all Peter's optimism fled, for Jane's eyes were red with weeping. When her sorrows pressed heavily upon Jane, she was a very fountain of tears. She threw up her hands as she saw Peter. "'Oh, mercy me, Peter Lane!' she cried in a heartbroken voice. "'Look what you've come to at your time of life. Nothing to wear but old rags and horse blankets on back and foot. It does seem as if nothing ever went right for you since the day you were born. Just poverty and bad health and trouble, and one thing after another. She wiped her eyes to make room in them for fresh tears. Every time I think of you, freezing to death in that shanty boat, and going hungry and cold, I... it makes me so miserable... It makes me feel so bad. Now, Jane, said Peter, uncomfortably, don't cry. Don't do it. It ain't so bad as all that. Every time I come to see you, you just cry and carry on. And I tell you, I don't need it done for me. I'm all right. I get along somehow. Never, never once have I said an unkind word to you, Peter said Jane damply. You shouldn't upbraid me with it, for I know it ain't your fault you turned out this way. I know you ain't got the health to go to work and earn a living if you wanted to. I do what I can to keep your house from falling down on my head. When I think what would become of this house if you didn't have me to do what I can to mend it up, the roof's leaking worse than ever. "'As soon as spring comes, I'm going to get some shingles and shingle up the leaky places,' said Peter. "'Maybe I'll put a whole new roof on. Now, just listen to what I want to say, please, Jane.' "'It's that makes me feel so awful bad, Peter,' said Jane, shaking her head. "'You mean so well, and you promise so much, and you see things so big, and yet you ain't got money to buy shoes nor clothes nor anything and for all i know you might be lying sick without a bite to eat and me having all i could do to hold body and soul together in a house like this time and again i've made up my mind to go and leave it and i would if it wasn't for you i feel my duty by you and i stay but work in a house like this wears me to the bone. It does, to the bone. It may have worn someone to the bone, but not Jane. She was one of those huge flabby women who are naturally lazy, who sit thinking of the work they have to do, but do not do it, and who linger long over their meals and weep into them. To Peter, her tears were worse than Mrs. Potter's sharp tongue for Mrs. Potter's reproaches were single of motive, while Jane's tears were too apt to be a mask for reproaches more cutting than Mrs. Potter's out-and-out -out hard words. Jane did not weep continually. She had the knack of weeping when tears would serve her purpose. From time to time, as the spirit moved her, Jane went to town and did plain sewing. She had had a husband, but had one no more, and he had left her a little money which she had kept in the bank, drawing four per cent regularly. It did not amount to much, only a couple of hundred dollars a year, but this she used most sparingly, leaving the greater part of the interest to accumulate. Perhaps she was sincere in her mourning for Peter, but she certainly did not want him in the house. As a provider, Peter had never been a success. He was too liberal, and in his periods of financial stringency he had been known to ask Jane for money. Not that he ever got it, but it was a thing to be guarded against. Jane guarded against it with tears. In fifteen minutes of tearful reproaches she could make Peter feel that he was the most worthless and cruel of men. She had so often reduced him to that state 
that he had come to fall into it naturally whenever he saw Jane, and he was usually only too glad to escape from her presence again and go back to the river life. Tears proclaim injustice, and a man like Peter, seeing them, falls easily into the belief that he must be in the wrong, and very badly in the wrong. In flying from Jane, he fled from the self-incrimination she planted in him. Now he sighed and took a seat on one of the kitchen chairs. "'Jane,' he said, "'this house is my house, ain't it?' "'You know it is, Peter,' she said reproachfully. "'No need to remind me of that, nor that I ain't any better than a pauper. If I was, it would be far from me to stay here trying to hold the old boards together for you. Many and many a time I wish you had health to live in this house, so I could go somewhere and live like a human being and let you take care of this cow pen, for it ain't no better than that, yourself. It would be a blessed thing for me, Peter, if you ever got your health. I could go then. Peter moved uneasily and frowned at the fresh tears. "'I wish you wouldn't cry, Jane,' he said. "'I want to talk sort of business to you this morning.' He paused, appalled by the effect his revelation would be apt to have on Jane. It must be made, however, and he plunged into it. "'I've got a boy. I've got a little feller about three years old.' that come to me one night when his ma died, and he ain't got anybody in the world but me, Jane, to take care of him. I've had him some months down at my boat, and he's the cutest, nicest little tyke you ever set eyes on. Why, he's, he's no more trouble round a place than a little kitten or a pup or something like that. You'd be just tickled to death with him. My first notion— he said more slowly, "'My first idea was to have him and me come here, so you could be a sort of ma to him, and I could be a sort of pa, so we'd make a sort of family-like. What he's got to have is a good home, first of all, and a shanty-boat ain't that. I see that. But I can see how easy-going I am, and how I might be an expense to you, for a while, anyway.' So I thought, maybe, if you would take the boy in— Now wait a minute, Jane, wait a minute. You're bound to hear me out. His sister had forgotten her sorrows in open-mouthed amazement as Peter talked, but as the startling proposal became clear, she dabbled at her eyes and sniffled. Peter knew what was coming, a new torrent of tears, an avalanche of sorrow. "'For heaven's sake, shut up for a minute till I get through,' he cried in exasperation. "'You ain't done nothing but weep over me since I was knee-high. Give me a rest for one time. I don't need weeping over. I'm all right. Ain't I just said I'll go away again?' "'You never understand me,' wept Jane. "'Yes, I do, too.' said Peter angrily. I understand you good. All you want is to weep me out of house and home, and I know it. I'm a sort of old bum, and I know that, too. But I've been fair to you right along, and all I get for it is to be wept over, and I'm sick of it. You ain't a sister. You're a... a fountain. You're an everlasting fountain." You let me come up and saw your wood, and you weep. And you let me make your garden, and you weep. And if you do give me a meal while I'm working for you, it's so wept into that my mouth tastes of salt for a week. I've put up with it just as long as I'm going to. I'll go, said Jane, sniveling. I'll go. I never thought to get such unkind words from my brother. "'Brother, nothing,' said Peter, thoroughly exasperated. "'What did you ever give me but shoves wrapped up in sorrow and grief? "'What did you ever do but jump on me and tear me to pieces "'and pull me apart to show me how worthless I was 
whilst you let on you was mourning over me. I guess I've had it done to me long enough to see through it, Jane, so you may as well shut off the bawling. You ain't no sister. You're a miser. Peter Lane! That's what you are, a miser said peter rising from his chair you're a weeping miser and you might as well know it that's why you don't want me around you're afraid i might cost you a nickel some time for two cents i'd put you out of the house you'd bawl some if you had to pay rent peter should have felt a sense of shame but he did not in some inexplicable way a huge weight seemed lifted from his chest he felt big and strong and efficient. It was a wonderful thing he had discovered. He, who had for so many years cringed before his sister's cruelty, was making her wince. He, Peter Lane, was not feeling worthless and mean. He was talking out as other men do. He was having a rage, and yet he was so self-controlled that he knew he could stop at any moment. He was not the tool of his anger, the anger was his instrument. His pale eyes blazed, but he ended with a scornful laugh. Jane did not flare up. She dropped her head on her table and cried again, but with real self-pity this time. "'Now, it ain't worth while to cry,' said Peter coldly. "'I've said all I've got to say on that subject.' All I've got now is a business proposition, and you can take it or not. If you want to take Buddy in and feed him and sleep him and treat him white the way he deserves, I'll pay you for it just as soon as I earn some money, and I'm going to get work right away. If you won't do that, you can take the house and have it, and I'm through with you. He stood with his hat in his hand, waiting. It seemed to him that Jane was waiting too long, that she was calculating the chances of getting her pay if she took the boy, and Peter knew his past record did not suggest any very strong probability of that. "'You'll get your money,' he said. "'I'm going to look for a job as soon as I get out from here. Don't you be afraid of that. You won't lose anything.' Her reply came so suddenly that it startled Peter. She jumped from her chair and stamped her foot angrily. Oh! she cried, clenching her fists, while all her anger blazed in her face. Ain't you insulted me enough? Get out of my house. Don't you ever come back. Peter put on his hat. He paused when his hand was on the doorknob, his face deathly white. "'If you ever get sick, Jane,' he said, "'you can leave word at George Rapp's livery stable. "'I'll come to you if you are sick.' And he went out, closing the door softly. Buddy was waiting where Peter had left him. "'I'm making a funny snake for you, Uncle Peter,' he said. "'Well, I should think you were,' said Peter, summoning all his cheerfulness. "'That's just the funniest old snake I ever did see. "'But you better let Uncle Peter have your jackknife now, buddy. "'We'll get along.' "'He gathered the boy, who obediently yielded the knife, into his arms. "'I'm going to see Aunt Jane now,' said the boy contentedly. "'No, I guess we won't go see your Aunt Jane today, buddy,' said Peter, holding the boy close. Put your head close up against Uncle Peter's shoulder, and he can carry you better. You ain't so heavy that way. Buddy put his head on Peter's shoulder and crooned one of Booge's verses contentedly. They walked a long way in this manner toward the town. From time to time, Peter shifted the boy from one shoulder to the other, and once or twice he allowed him to walk, but not far. He wanted to feel Buddy in his arms. "'I shouldn't wonder,' said Peter, as they entered the outskirts of the town, "'if I had to go on a trip right soon. I can't seem to think of any way out of it.' "'I like to go on trips with you, Uncle Peter,' said Buddy. 
"'Well, you see, buddy boy,' said Peter, "'this here trip I can't take you on, so I've got to leave you with a man, a man that looks a good deal like that Kazoozer man. But you mustn't be afraid of him, because all he is going to do is to take you for a ride in a horse and buggy out to where you'll stay. It may be some time before I see you again, but I want you should remember me. I guess you will, won't you?' "'Yes, Uncle Peter.' "'That's right. You just remember Uncle Peter every day, but don't you worry for him, and some day maybe I'll come and get you. I've got a lot of work to do first that you wouldn't understand, such as building up a new man from the ground to the top of his head. But I'll get it done some time, and I'll come for you the first thing after I do. You want I should, don't you?' "'Yes,' said Buddy. For the rest of the way to town, Peter held the boy very close in his arms, and did not think of his tired muscles at all. He was thinking of his perfidy to the trusting child, for he was without money, and without it he could see nothing to do but deliver the boy to Briggles and the unknown. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen A Ray of Hope. The Marcy's Run Road, on which Peter's sister lived, led into Riverbank past the cemetery, and near the cemetery stood a group of small stores. One of these, half grocery and half saloon, was even more unkempt than the others, but before its window Peter stopped. A few small coins, the residue after his purchasing trip of the day before, remained in his pocket, and in the window was a square of cardboard announcing, Hot Beef Soup Today. Hot beef soup, when a man has tramped many miles carrying a heavy child, is a temptation. Buddy himself would be glad of a bowl of hot soup, and Peter opened the door and entered. The store was narrow and dark. A few feet just inside the door were occupied by the scanty stock of groceries, tobacco, and cheap candy, and back of this was the bar, with two small tables in the space before it. The whole place was miserably dirty. It was no gilded liquor palace with mirrors and glittering cash registers. The bar was of plain pine, painted barn red, and the whole arrangement was primitive and cheap. Beyond the bar room a partition cut off the living room, and this completed Mrs. Crink's place. Mrs. Crink had a bad reputation. During the stringent prohibition days she had run a speakeasy without paying the town the usual monthly disorderly house fine, and had served her term in jail. After that she was strongly suspected of bootlegging whiskey, and she had purchased this new place but a few days since. She was a thin, sour-faced, angular woman, ugly alike in face and temper. When Peter opened the door a bell sounded sharply, but the high voice of Mrs. Crink in the living room drowned the bell. She was scolding and reviling at the top of her voice, swearing like a man and a child was sobbing and pleading. Peter heard the sharp slap of a hand against a face and a cry from the child, and Mrs. Crink came into the bar room, her eyes glaring and her face dark with anger. "'Well, what do you want?' she snarled. "'I'd like to get two bowls of soup for me and the boy, if it ain't too much trouble,' said Peter. "'Everything's trouble.' whined Mrs. Crink. I don't expect nothing else. A woman can't make a living without these cranks telling her what she shall and what she shan't. Shut up that howling, you little devil, or I'll come in there and bat your head off. She went into the living room and brought out the two bowls of soup, placing them on one of the small tables. Peter lifted Buddy into a chair. 
Mrs. Crink began wiping off the beer-wet bar. "'I wonder if you could let me have about a dime's worth of crackers and cheese?' he asked, and Mrs. Crink dropped the dirty rag with which she was wiping the bar. "'Come out here and shut up your ballin' and swab off this bar,' she yelled, and the door of the back room opened and a girl came out. She was the merest child. She came hesitatingly, holding her arm before her face, and the old hag of a woman jerked up the filthy wet rag and slapped her across the face. It was none of Peter's business, but he half arose from his chair and then dropped back again. It made his blood boil, but he had not associated with shanty boat men and women without learning that in the coarse strata of humanity slaps and blows and ugly words are often the common portion of children. He would have liked to interfere, but he knew the inefficiency of any effort he might make, and like a shock it came to him that it was for things like this that Briggs rescued, or pretended to rescue, little children. It was not so bad then, after all. If he must give up Buddy, there would be some compensation in telling Briggles of this poor child, who deserved far more attention of his society. All this passed through his mind in an instant, but before he could turn back to his bowl of soup, Buddy uttered a cry of joy, and, scrambling from his chair, ran across the floor toward the weeping girl. "'Oh, Susie! Susie! My Susie!' he shouted, and threw himself upon her. The impetus of his coming almost threw the child off her feet, and she staggered back, but the next instant she had clasped her arms around the boy and was hugging him in a close, youthful embrace of joy. "'My buddy! My buddy!' she kept repeating over and over, as if all other words failed her, as they will in an excess of sudden surprise. "'My buddy! My buddy!' The woman stared for an instant in open-mouthed astonishment, and then her eyes flashed with anger. She reached out her hand to grasp the girl, but Peter Lane thrust it aside. His own eyes could flash, and the woman drew back. "'Now don't you do that,' he said hotly. "'You get out of my store, then,' shouted Mrs. Crink. "'You take your brat and get out.' "'I'll get out,' said Peter slowly, "'as soon as I am quite entirely ready to do so.' I hope you will understand that, and I'll be ready when I have ate my soup." The woman glared at him. She let her hand drop behind the bar where she had a piece of lead pipe, and then, suddenly, she laughed a high cackling laugh to cover her defeat and let her eyes fall. She slouched on the front of the shop for the crackers and cheese, and Peter seated himself again at the small table and looked at the children. "'Where's Mama?' he heard the girl ask, and Buddy's reply. "'Mama went away,' and he saw the look of wonder on the girl's face. "'Come here,' Peter said, and the girl came to the table. "'I guess you're Buddy's sister he's been telling me about, ain't you?' said Peter kindly. "'And I'm his Uncle Peter he's been staying with on a shanty boat. Your Ma—' He hesitated and looked at the girl's sweet, clear eyes. "'Your ma went away, like Buddy said, Susie, but you don't want to think she ran away and left him, for that wouldn't be so, not at all. She had to go, or she wouldn't have gone. I guess, I guess she'd have come and got you. Yes, I guess that's what she had on her mind. She spoke of you quite a little before she went on her trip.' "'I want you should take me away from here,' said the girl suddenly. "'Well, now I wish I could, Susie,' said Peter. "'But I don't see how I can. Maybe I can arrange it.' He poised his soup-spoon in the air. "'Did Reverend Mr. Briggles bring you here?' "'Not here,' said Susie. "'Mrs. Crink didn't live here then.' 
"'Well, that's all the same,' said Peter. "'I just wanted to inquire about it. "'You'd better eat your soup, buddy boy. "'Well, now, let me see.' Peter stared into the soup, as if it might hold, hidden in its muggy depths, the answer to his riddle. "'Just at present I'm sort of unable to do what I'd like to do myself,' he said. "'I'd like to take you right with me, but I've got a certain friend that was quite put out because I didn't bring your ma to—to to see her when your ma stopped in at my boat. And I guess maybe—' Mrs. Crink was returning with the crackers and cheese, and Peter ended hurriedly, "'I guess maybe you better stay here until I make arrangements.' It was a strange picture, the boy eating his soup gluttonously, Peter Lane in his comedy tramp garb of blanket and blanket strips, and the little girl staring at him with big trustful eyes. Mrs. Crink put the crackers and cheese on the table. "'If you've got through taking up time that don't belong to you, maybe I can get some work out of this brat,' she snapped. "'Why, yes, ma'am.' said peter politely it only so happened that this boy was her brother we didn't want to discommode you at all susie turned away to her work of swabbing the bar and peter divided the crackers and cheese equally between himself and buddy i don't much care to have tramps come in here anyway said mrs crink i never knew one yet that wouldn't pick up anything loose but Peter made no reply. He had a matter of tremendous import on his mind. He felt that he had taken the weight of Susie's troubles on his shoulders, in addition to those of Buddy, and he had resolved to ask Widow Potter to take the two children. The parting of the two children had for them none of the pathos it had for Peter. When Buddy had eaten the last scrap of cracker, he got down from his chair. "'Good-bye, Susie,' he said. "'Good-bye, buddy,' she answered, and that was all, and Peter led the boy out of the place. There are, in Riverbank, alleys between each two of the streets parallel with the river, and Peter, now that he had once more resolved not to allow Briggles to have Buddy, took to the alleys as he passed through the town. The outlandishness of his garb made him the more noticeable, he knew, and he wished to avoid being seen. He traversed the entire town thus, even where a creek made it necessary for him to scramble down one bank and up another until the alleys ended at the far side of the town. There he crossed the vacant lot where a lumber mill had once stood and struck into the river road. The boy seemed to take it all as a matter of course, but Peter kept a wary eye on the road, ready to seek a hiding place at the approach of any rig that looked as if it might contain the Reverend Briggles, but none appeared. A farmer, returning from town with a wagon, stopped at a word from Peter, and allowed him to put Buddy in the wagon and clamber in with him. They got out again at Mrs. Potter's gate. The house was closed, and the doors locked. Peter tried them all before he was convinced he had had the long tramp for nothing, and then he led Buddy toward the barn. As he neared the barn, the barn door opened, and a man came out, carrying a water bucket. He stared at Peter. "'Mrs. Potter is not at home, I guess,' said Peter. "'Nope,' said the man. "'Anything I can do for you?' "'It's business on which I'll have to see her personally,' said Peter. "'She wasn't expecting I'd come. Is she going to be back soon?' "'Well, I guess she won't be back today,' said the man. "'She only hired me about a week ago, so she ain't got to telling me all her plans yet, but she told me it was like as not she'd go up to Derlingport today.' and maybe she might come home tomorrow, and maybe not till next day. Want to leave any word for her? No, said Peter slowly. I guess there's no word I could leave. I guess not. I'm much obliged to you, but I won't leave no word. 
Come on, buddy boy. We got to go back to town now, before night sets in. Where are we going now, Uncle Peter? asked the boy. Now? Well, now we're going to see a friend I've got. You never slept in a great big stable where there are lots of horses, did you? You never went to sleep on a great big pile of hay, did you? That'll be fun, won't it, buddy boy? Yes, Uncle Peter, said the child cheerfully, and they began the long, cold walk to town. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen An Encounter. That horse, said George Rapp, slapping the colt on the flank, is as good a horse as you can get for the money in ten counties, and you won't find anybody that will offer what I do in trade for your old one nowhere. You'd say that anyway, George Rapp, said Mrs. Potter. You ain't here to run down what you want to sell. Seems to me the colt acts skittish. What you said you wanted was a young horse, said Rapp with a shrug. I don't know what you want. You want a young horse, and this is young. And you don't want a skittish horse, and all young horses are more or less that way. What I want is a young, strong horse, Mrs. Potter began. You've told me that a million times and two, and if you tell me it again, I'll know it by heart well enough to sing it, said Rapp. There he stands, just like you say, a young, strong horse. A skittish animal like this colt ain't fit for a woman to drive, said Mrs. Potter. And you ought to have a driver to drive him, as you said about ten thousand times before, said Rapp, with good-natured tolerance. But Peter Lane ain't come up to town yet, if that's what you're working around to. Oh, get along with you, said Mrs. Potter. I got a hired man now. Well, you meant Peter, didn't you? Why don't you come right out and say so? But I guess you won't get Peter to drive this colt for a while yet. He ain't sick. No, nor he ain't dead. But as near as I can make out, Peter is going to jail. Mrs. Potter turned sharply, and George Rapp grinned. He could not help it, she showed such consternation. Peter in jail? she cried. Well, not yet said Rapp, chuckling at her amazement. They're out hunting him now. The dogs of the law is on his trail. That feller Briggles I told you of got his head broke by a tramp Peter took into my boat, and he's real sore, both in head and feelings. Last night him and a sort of posse went down to get the whole crowd, but Peter had skipped out with the kid. "'Good for Peter! Good for Peter!' exclaimed Mrs. Potter. I never looked for so much spunk. It was his boy as much as anybody's, wasn't it? Look so to me, said Rapp. But this here United States of Riverbank County seems to think different. Maybe Peter ain't been washing the boy's face regular three times a day. Anyhow, Briggles got a court order for the boy, and he's going to jug Peter. "'You talk so much nonsense, I don't know what to believe,' complained the widow. "'Anything I say is apt to be more or less nonsense, except when I'm talking horse,' said Rapp. "'But this ain't. Briggles and the deputy sheriff is out now, swearing to bring Peter in by the seat of his pants, or any way they can get him. "'Well, if Peter Lane had a wife to look after him and tell him how so once in a while,' He wouldn't get into trouble like this, said Mrs. Potter with aggravation. He's enough to drive a body crazy. George Rapp's eyes twinkled. The next time I see Peter, I'll say, Peter, I've been trying to sell a colt to Mrs. Potter since Lord knows when, and she's holding off until she gets a husband to tend the colt. 
I don't want to hurry you none, I'll say to him, but when you get done serving them ten years in the penitentiary, just fix it up for me. I'd like to sell this colt before he dies of old age. You think you're smart, George Rapp, said Mrs. Potter, reddening, but when you talk like that, when I've heard Peter Lane say a dozen times that you're the best friend he's got in the world, it's time somebody took hold for him. I wouldn't buy a horse off you, not if it was the only one in the world. George Rapp patted the colt on the neck and ran his hand down the sleek shoulder. Now, Mrs. Potter, he said, you know better than that. I'm just as much Peter's friend as anybody is. I'll bail him out if he gets in jail, and I'll pay his fine, if there is one. But don't you worry. Peter ain't a fool. By this time Peter and that boy is in Burlington. Peter's safe. It seemed as if Rapp's cheerful prediction had been fulfilled, for, as he spoke, hoofs clattered on the plank incline that led into the stable. Rapp led the colt out of the way as the two-horse rig containing the Reverend Rasmer Briggles and the deputy sheriff reached the main floor. It was evident they had not found Peter. "'Wild goose hunt this time, George,' said the deputy as he jumped from the carriage. "'That so?' said Rapp, walking around the team. "'Got the team pretty hot for such cold weather, didn't you?' "'We drove like blazes,' said the deputy. "'But I didn't get heated much. "'Colder than the dickens. "'How are you, Mrs. Potter? "'George robbing you again?' Mr. Briggles was climbing from the carriage slowly. He was bundled in a heavy ulster with a wide collar that turned up over his ears. He wore ear mufflers, and a scarf was tied over his cap and under his chin. On his hands were thick, fur-lined mittens, and his trouser legs were buckled into high arctics. Over his nose and across one cheek a strip of adhesive plaster showed where Bouge had hit the old kazoozer and scratched him on the nose as he had sung. Mr. Briggles was not in a good temper. Under his arrangement with his society this had been an unprofitable week, for he had not rescued a single child at twenty dollars per child. He slowly untied his scarf, removed his ear tabs, and unbuttoned his ulster. He affected ministerial garb under his outer roughness, it had a good effect on certain old ladies as he sat in their parlors, coaxing money from them, forty per cent commission on all collected, and his face had what George Rapp called that solemncholy sneaker look. You expected him to put his fingertips together and look at the ceiling. There are but few Briggleses left to prey on the gullibly charitable today, and thank God for that. Their day is over. Most of them are in stock-selling games now. "'We were on Sheriff's business today, Brother Rapp,' said Briggles, when he had opened his coat. "'You can charge the rig to the county.' "'How about that, Joe?' Rapp asked the deputy. "'What's the diff?' asked Joe carelessly. "'The county can stand it.' He had entered the office, where Rapp always kept his barrel stove red hot, and was kicking his toes against the foot rail of the stove. "'Want the team again tomorrow?' asked Rapp. "'I want it tomorrow,' said Joe. "'I got to go to Sweetland to put an attachment to a feller's hogs. I don't know what your friend Briggles wants.' "'I want you to help me find this boy, brother,' Briggles began but the deputy merely turned his back to the stove and looked at him over one shoulder. "'Oh, shut up,' he said. "'I ain't your brother.' "'What's the matter with you, Joe?' asked Rapp. "'You act sore.' "'Sore nothing. I'm sick at my stomach. You'd be if you had to drive a polecat around the county all day.' "'Now, Brother Venby,' said Mr. Briggles pleadingly. You misunderstood me entirely. If you will let me explain. 
"'You go and explain to your grandmother,' said Joe roughly. "'You can't explain to me. "'If I didn't have on my deputy sheriff badge, "'I'd come out there and do some explaining "'with a wagon spoke on my own account. "'Say, George, did this feller get a rig from you once "'to take a young girl that he brought down from Derlingport "'to a good home? "'Nice little girl, wasn't she? "'Where do you suppose he took her?' Mrs. Crinks. Say, come in here a minute. Rapp went into the office, and Joe closed the door. A hostler led the team to the rear of the stable, and Mr. Briggles, as if feeling a protective influence in the presence of Mrs. Potter, moved nearer to her. He pushed back his cap and wiped his forehead. In this charity work we meet the opposition of all rough characters, madam. He began suavely, but she interrupted him. "'You're the man that's pestering Peter Lane, ain't you?' she asked. "'Only within the law, only within the law,' said Mr. Briggles, soothingly. "'I act only for the society, and the society keeps within the law.' "'Law fiddlesticks,' said Mrs. Potter. "'What's this nonsense about putting Peter Lane in jail?' "'We fear we shall have to make an example of him,' said Mr. Briggles. "'The ungodly throw obstructions in our path, and we must combat them when we can. This Lane has evaded a court order. We trust he will receive a term in prison. We have faith that Judge Bennings will uphold the right.' "'Huh! So that old rascal of a Bennings is the man that let you bother Peter Lane, is he?' "'Seems to me he's getting pretty free with his court orders and nonsense. "'But I guess he ain't heard from me yet.' "'She turned her back on Mr. Briggles and almost ran down the incline into the street. "'Unluckily for Judge Bennings, he was almost too convenient to Rapp's livery-feed and sales stable, "'living in an old brick mansion that occupied the corner of the block. "'But luckily for him, he was not at home.' Mrs. Potter poured out her wrath on the German servant girl. When Mrs. Potter had hastened away, Mr. Briggles hesitated. He could see the deputy sheriff and George Rapp through the smoky glass of the office door, and Joe was talking steadily, only stopping now and then to expectorate, while Rapp's good-natured face was scowling. Mr. Briggles buttoned his ulster. From the look on George Rapp's face, he felt it would be better to be out of the stable when Rapp came out of the office. He turned. Peter Lane was staggering wearily up the incline into the stable, his back bent with fatigue, and Buddy sound asleep in his arms. Mr. Briggles watched the uncouth, blanket-draped pair advance, and when Peter stood face to face with him, a smile of satisfaction twisted his hard mouth. Peter looked into the fellow's shrewd eyes and drew a long breath. "'Your name's Briggles, ain't it?' he asked listlessly. "'Mine's Peter Lane. This here's Buddy. I guess we got to the end of our string.' Peter shifted the sleeping boy to his shoulder and touched the child's freckled face softly. "'I wished you would do what's possible to put him into a nice home,' said Peter. "'A home where he won't be treated harsh. "'I've got so used to Buddy, I feel almost like he was my own son, "'and I wouldn't like him to be treated harsh. "'He's such a nice little feller.' "'He stopped, for he could say no more just then. "'He lowered his arms until Buddy's head slid softly from his shoulder to the crook of his arm.' "'Well,' he said, holding out the sleeping boy, "'I guess you might as well take him now as any time.' Mr. Briggles reached forward to take the boy just as Mrs. Potter came rushing up the stable incline, waving her hand wildly. "'Oh, Smith,' she called. "'Peter Smith. You're just the man I've been looking for, Smith.' Peter stared at her uncomprehendingly for one instant, and as he understood her useless little strategy, his eyes softened. 
"'I'm just as much obliged to you, Mrs. Potter,' he said. "'But I've already told this man who I am. I guess I'll go now.' He looked from one to the other, helplessly, and Mrs. Potter put out her arms and took the sleeping boy. "'Peter, you're a perfect fool,' she said angrily. "'I guess I am,' said Peter. "'Yes, I guess I am.' He bent and kissed Buddy's warm cheek. "'I'd like to be somewhere else when he wakes up,' he explained, and turned away. He had started down the driveway when Mr. Briggles stepped after him and laid a detaining hand on his arm. "'Wait,' said Mr. Briggles. "'The sheriff's deputy is in the office here. He has been looking for you.' "'Oh, that's all right,' said Peter. You can tell Joe I've gone up to the jail. And he drew his arm away and went on down the street. Mrs. Potter called after him. Peter Lane, Peter, she called. But Peter had hurried away. Buddy raised his head suddenly and looked up into Mrs. Potter's face. I know who you are, he said fearlessly. You're Aunt Jane. No, child, said Mrs. Potter. I ain't anybody's aunt. I'm just a worthless old creature. Where's Uncle Peter? asked Buddy in his sudden way. Now don't you worry, said Mrs. Potter. Uncle Peter has gone away. I know, said Buddy, now wide awake. Uncle Peter told me. I want to get down. Mrs. Potter put him down, and he stood leaning against her knee holding tightly to her skirt and eyeing Mr. Briggles distrustfully, for his quick eyes recognized the old kazoozer Uncle Booge had thrown off the boat. But before he could give utterance to what was running through his small head, the office door opened and George Rapp and the deputy came out. Rapp walked up to Mr. Briggles. "'All right,' he said roughly. "'You've got the kid, I see.' and I guess that's all you want in my stable, so you pick him up and get out of here, and don't you ever come here again. Do you understand that? If you do, I'm going to show you how I treat skunks. You understand? Involuntarily, Mr. Briggles put up his elbow, as if to ward off a blow, and Buddy clung the tighter to Mrs. Potter's skirt. The ex-minister reached out his hand for the child, and Buddy turned and ran. Mr. Briggles did not run after him. He stood staring at the child. "'I don't want that boy,' he said. "'I don't want him. I couldn't do anything with that boy. He's a cripple.' Buddy, stopping at the head of the incline, gazed wide-eyed from one to the other. "'Didn't anybody want a boy that was lame?' "'I got one good foot,' he said boastingly. And suddenly Mrs. Potter's strong, work-muscled arms gathered Buddy up and held him close to her breast, so that one of the sharp buttons of her coat made him shake his head and forget the angry tears he had been ready to shed. "'I want him,' she cried, her eyes blazing. "'I'll take him, you—you—' you... No one knew what she would have called Mr. Briggles, for with an unexpectedness that made Mr. Briggles's teeth snap together, George Rapp shut an iron hand on the back of his neck and bumped a knee into Mr. Briggles from behind so vigorously as to lift him off his feet. With the terrible knee bumping him at every step, Mr. Briggles was rushed down the incline with a haste that carried him entirely across the street and left him gasping and trembling against a toolbox alongside the railway tracks. George Rapp returned wiping his hands in his coat skirts as if he had just been handling a snake or some other slimy creature. "'Now we got done with pleasure,' he said with a laugh. "'We'll talk business. Do you want that colt, or don't you, Mrs. Potter?' End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Jackknife Man 
by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Jail Uncles The county jail stood back of the courthouse on Maple Street and was a three story brick building, flush with the sidewalk, with barred windows. To the right was the stone yard, where, when the sheriff was having good trade, you could hear the slow tapping of hammers on limestone as the victims of the law pounded rock, breaking the large stones into road metal. As a factory, the prisoners did not seem to care whether they reached a normal output of cracked rock or not. Seated on a folded gunny sack laid upon a smooth stone in this yard, Bouge was receiving justice at the hands of the law. He pulled a rough piece of limestone toward him, turned it over eight or ten times to find the point of least resistance, settled the stone snugly into the limestone chips, and yawned. Eight or ten minutes later, feeling chilly and cramped in the arms, he raised his hammer and let it fall on the rock, and yawned. The other prisoners, there were five in all, worked at the same breathless pace. The stone yard was protected from the vulgar gaze of the outer slaves of business and labor by a tall board fence, notable as the only fence of any size in Riverbank that never bore circus posters on its outer surface. Several times within the memory of man there had been jail deliveries from the stone yard. In each case the delivery had been effected in the same manner. The escaping prisoner climbed over the fence and went away. One such renegade, recaptured, told why he had fled. "'I won't stay in no hotel,' he said, "'where they've got cockroaches in the soup. If this here sheriff don't brace up, there won't be none of us patronize his darn hotel next winter.' Peter, enveloped in his blanket serape, pulled the knob of the doorbell of the jail, and waited. He heard the bell gradually cease jangling, and presently he heard feet in the corridor, and the door opened. "'Well, what do you want?' asked the sheriff's wife. "'If you want Ed, he ain't here. You'll have to come back.' "'I've come to give myself up,' said Peter. "'My name's Peter Lane.' "'Well, it don't make any difference what your name is,' said Mrs. Stevens, flatly. "'You can't give yourself up to me, and that's all there is to it. Every time the weather turns cold, a lot of you fellows come around and give yourselves up, and I'm sick and tired of it. I won't take another one of you unless you're arrested in a proper manner. Half the time Ed can't collect the board money. If you want to get in here, you go down to the calaboose and get arrested in the right way. But I'm sort of looked for here, said Peter. Joe Venby knows I'm coming here, and if Ed was here... Oh, if Ed was here, he'd feed you for nothing, I dare say, said Mrs. Stevens. He's the easiest creature I ever see. If it wasn't for me, he'd lose money on this jail right along. "'Can't I come in and wait for Ed?' asked Peter. "'I ought to stay here when I'm wanted. "'I don't want Ed or Joe to think I'd play a trick on them.' "'You can't come in,' said Mrs. Stevens. "'The last man that come and gave himself up to me "'stole a shell-box off my what-not, "'and I won't have that happen again. "'You can come back after a while.' "'Can't you let me wait in the stone-yard?' asked Peter. "'See here,' said the sheriff's wife. "'I'm busy getting a meal, and I've no time to stand talking. Ed locked them boarders in the yard when he went away, and he took the key. If you want to get into that stone yard, you'll have to climb over the fence, and that's all there is to it. I have no time to fritter away talking.' She slammed the door in Peter's face, and Peter turned away. The fence was high, but Peter was agile, and he scrambled up and managed to throw one leg over, and thus reached the top. "'Come on in,' Booge's gruff voice greeted him, 
and Peter looked down to see the tramp immediately below him. "'They got Buddy,' said Peter, as he dropped to the ground inside the fence. "'Did, eh?' said Booge, stretching his arms. "'I was sort of in hopes you'd kill that old kazoozer if you had to. I don't like him. He's the feller that married me and lies, and I ain't ever forgive him. One murden was enough in a town. I was all of that name the world ought to have had in it.' "'Murden?' said Peter. "'Is that your name?' "'Why, sure it is. Didn't I ever tell you?' asked Booge. "'No, I guess I didn't. Come to think of it, it wasn't important what you called me, and Buddy sort of clung to Booge. Where is the little feller?' "'Your name's Murden, and your wife was Lies Murden?' repeated Peter, staring at the tramp. "'Is that so?' "'Cross my heart. If you want me to, I'll sing it for you.' "'Booge,' said Peter soberly, "'she's dead. Your wife is dead.' The tramp was serious now. "'Lies is dead?' he asked. "'Honest, Peter?' "'She's dead,' Peter repeated. "'She died in my boat. "'She come there one awful stormy night, and she died there. "'She was run out of Derlingport, and she died, and I buried her.' Booge put down his stone hammer, and for a full minute stared at the chapped and soiled hands on his knees. Then he shook his head. "'Ain't that peculiar? Ain't that odd?' he said. "'Lies dead, and she died in your boat, and why—' he cried suddenly. "'Buddy's my boy, ain't he?' "'Yes,' said Peter. "'He's your boy.' "'Ain't that queer? Ain't that strange?' Booge repeated, shaking his bushy head. "'Ain't that odd? And Buddy was my boy all the time. And he's a nice little feller, too, ain't he?' He's a real nice little feller. Ain't that odd?" He still shook his head as he picked up the hammer. He struck the rock before him several listless blows. "'I wonder if Lies told you what become of Susie?' he asked. "'I know what become of her,' said Peter. "'Briggles got her, too. She's with a, with a lady in town here. He could not bring himself to tell the imprisoned man what the lady was in reality. "'That's fine,' said Booge, laughing mirthlessly. "'I knowed all along I'd bring up my family first class. All we needed to make our home a regular God bless her was for me to get far enough away and for someone to get the kids away from lies. Do you know, Peter, I feel sort of sorry for lies, too.' That's funny, ain't it? Not if she was your wife, it ain't, said Peter. Yes, it is, Booze insisted. A man don't feel sorry for a wife like that. Generally, he's glad when she's gone, but I sort of feel like Lies didn't have a fair show. She was real bright. If I hadn't married her, she'd probably have worked her way over to Chicago and got in a chorus or blackmailed some rich feller. But I was a handicap to her right along. She couldn't be out-and-out whole-souled bad when she was a married lady. She'd just get started and begin whooping things when she'd remember she was a wife and a mother and all that, and she'd lose her nerve. She never got real bad, and she never got real good. I guess I stood in her way too much." "'You mean you wasn't one thing or the other?' asked Peter. "'Yep, that's why I went away when I did go,' said Booge. "'I seen Lies wasn't happy, and I wasn't happy, so I went. The sight of me just made her miserable. She'd come in after being away a week or so, and she'd moan out how wicked she was and how good I was, and that she was going to reform for my sake.' and she'd be unhappy for a month, all regrets and sorrow and punishing herself, 
and then I'd take my turn and get on a spree, and when I come back, she'd be gone. Then she'd come back and go through the whole thing once more. It was real torture for her. She never figured that my kind of bad was as bad as her kind of bad. I never gave her no help to stay straight, either. I guess what I'd ought to have done was to whack her over the head with an axe handle when she come back, or give her a black eye, but I didn't have no real stamina. I was a fool that way. "'I don't see why you married her,' said Simple Peter. "'Well, I was a fool that way, too,' said Bouge. She seemed so young and all to be throwed out by her mother and father, so I just married her because nobody else offered to, as you might say, to give her baby some sort of a dad when it come. It didn't get much of a sort of a dad either when it got me. "'Then you ain't Susie's pa?' asked Peter. "'Lord, no.' "'And Buddy?' "'Oh, yes. And ain't he a nice little feller? Seems like he's got all lizes and my good in him, don't it? And none of our bad? And to think I was there with him all the time, and you didn't even like me to be uncle to him. I wonder, Peter, if you ever see him again, just tell him his dad's dead, will you, Peter?' "'If you want, I should, Bouge,' said Peter reluctantly. "'Yes, and tell him some sort of story about his poor but honest parents. Tell him I was a traveling man and got killed in a wreck. Tell him I had a fine voice to sing with, or some little thing like that, so he can remember it. A little kid likes to remember things like that when he grows up and misses the folks he ought to have.' "'I'll tell him you were always kind to him, for so you was, in my boat.' said Peter. I'll tell him that when he was a little fellow you used to sing him to sleep. Yeah, something like that, said Bouge, and went on breaking rock. Suddenly he looked up. I wonder if it would do any good for me to give you a paper saying you were to have all my rights in him. I don't know that I've got any, but I'd sort of like to have you have Buddy. They talked of this for some time, and it was agreed that when Bouge had served his term and was released, he was to sign such a paper before a notary and leave it with George Rapp, and they were still discussing the possibility of such a paper being of any value when the door of the jail opened and the sheriff came into the stone yard. "'Hello, Peter,' he said. "'My wife tells me you want to see me. What's the trouble?' Peter explained. "'Well, I'm sorry I've got to turn you out,' said the sheriff, regretfully. "'I've got the jail so full you mightn't be comfortable anyway, and I've taken in about all I can afford to take on speculation. I'd like to keep you, but I don't see how I can do it, Peter. I don't make enough feeding you fellows to take any risk on not getting paid. I guess you'll have to get out.' "'But I'm guilty, Ed,' said Peter. "'I guess I am, anyway.' "'Can't help it,' said the sheriff, firmly. "'I don't know nothing about that. "'If you want to come to jail, "'you've got to be served with papers in the regular way. "'The city don't okay my bills hit or miss no more. "'I guess you'll have to get out. "'I can't run the risk of keeping you on your own say-so.' "'If you say so, Ed,' said Peter. "'If anything comes up, you'll know I've tried to get into jail anyway. "'What should you say I ought to do?' "'What you ought to do,' said the sheriff, "'is to go home and wait until somebody comes and arrests you in proper shape.' "'I'll do so, if you say so, Ed,' said Peter. "'I'm living in George Rapp's houseboat, down at Big Tree Lake.' and if you want me, I'll be there. I'll wait till you come. He shook Bouge's hand, and the sheriff unlocked the gate of the stone yard, and Peter passed out into the cold world. 
End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of The Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Funny Cats. Peter avoided the main street, for he was aware he was a curious sight in his blanket serape, and it was too comfortable to throw away, and, in addition, would be his only bed clothing when he reached his boat. He hurried along Oak Street, as less frequented than the main street, for he had almost the entire length of the town to pass through. As it was growing late, he was anxious to strike the bluff road in time to catch a ride with some homeward-bound farmer. His bag of provisions was still at the farmer's on the hillside, the shanty boat awaited him, and he must take up his life where it had been interrupted. For the present he was powerless to aid either Susie or Buddy. Peter had a long walk before him if he did not catch a ride, and he started briskly, but in front of the Baptist church he paused. A bulletin board stood before the door calling attention to a sale to be held in the Sunday school room, and the heading of the announcement caught his eye. All for the children, it said. It seemed that there were poor children in the town, children with insufficient clothes, children with no shoes, children without underwear, and a sale was to be held for them. Candy, cakes, fancy work, toys, and all the usual Christmas-time church sale articles were enumerated. Peter read the bulletin and passed on. He was successful in catching a ride and found his sack of provisions at the farmer's and carried it to the boat on his back. The boat was as he had left it, and little damage had been done during his absence. The river had fallen, and his temporary mooring rope, too taut to permit the strain, had snapped, but the shanty boat had grounded and was safe locked in the ice until spring. Inside the cabin not a thing had been touched. The shavings still lay on the floor, where they had fallen while he was making Buddy's last toy, and the toys themselves were under the bunk, just as he had left them. Peter felt a pang of loneliness as he gathered them up and placed them on his table, with the new stockings and the ABC blocks. He put the new Bible on the clock shelf. The toys made quite an array, and Peter looked at them one by one thinking of the child. There were more than a dozen of them, all sorts of animals, and they still bore the marks of Buddy's fingers. It was quite dark by the time Peter had stowed away his provisions, and he lighted the lamp, with a newly formed resolution in his mind. He dropped the ABC blocks into the depths of his gunny sack, and, looking at each for the last time, let the crudely carved animals follow one by one. He held the funny cat in his hand quite a while, hesitatingly, and then set it on the clock shelf beside the Bible. But almost immediately he took it down again and dropped it among its fellows in the sack. The Bible, too, he took from the shelf and put in the sack, and, last of all, he added the few bits of clothing Buddy had left in his flight. He tied the neck of the sack firmly with sane twine and set it under the table. All his mementos of Buddy were in that sack, and Peter, with a sigh, chose a clean piece of maple wood, seated himself on the edge of the bunk, and began whittling a kitchen spoon. Once more he was alone. Once more he was a hermit. Once more he was a mere jackknife man, and Buddy was but a memory. Peter tried to put even the memory out of his mind, but that was not as easy as putting toys in a gunny sack. If he tried to think of painting the boat, he had to think of George Rapp, and then he could think of nothing but the hasty parting in Rapp's barn and how the soft kinks of Buddy's hair snuggled under the rough blanket hood. If he tried to think of wooden spoons, he thought of funny cats, and if he tried to think of nothing, he caught Bouge's nonsense rhymes running through his head 
and saw Buddy clinging eagerly to Booge's knee and begging, "'Sing it again, Booge, sing it again!' "'Thunder!' he exclaimed at last. "'I wished I had that clock to take apart.' He put the unfinished spoon aside, and choosing another piece of maple wood, began whittling a funny cat, singing, "'Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby,' as he worked. It was late when his eyelids drooped and he wrapped himself in his blanket. Three more cats had been added to the animals in the gunny sack. "'Some little kid like Buddy will like them,' he thought with satisfaction, and dropped asleep. Early the next morning he tramped across the bottom to the farmers. "'You said you was going to town today,' Peter said, "'and I thought maybe you'd leave this sack at the Baptist church for me, if it ain't too much out of your way. It's some old truck I won't have any use for, and I took notice they were having a sale there today. You don't need to say anything. Just hand it in.' Before the farmer could ask him in to have breakfast, Peter had disappeared toward the woodyard, and when later he started for town he could hear Peter's saw. At the Baptist church the farmer left the sack. A dozen or more women were busily arranging for the sale, and one of them took the sack, holding it well out from her skirt. "'For our sale? How nice!' she cried in the excited tone women acquire when a number of them are working together in a church. Who are we to thank for it? Oh, I guess there ain't no thanks necessary, said the farmer. I guess you won't find it much. I just brought it along because I promised I would. It's from a shanty boatman down my way. Lane's his name, Peter Lane. Oh, said the woman, her voice losing much of its enthusiasm. Yes, I know who he is. He's the jackknife man. Tell him Mrs. Van Dyne thanks him. It is very kind of him to think of us. All right, get up. Mrs. Van Dyne carried the sack into the Sunday school room and snipped the twine with her scissors, which hung from her belt on a pink ribbon. She was a charming little woman, with bright eyes and rosy cheeks and she was the more excited this afternoon because she had been able to bring her friend and visitor, Mrs. Montgomery, and Mrs. Montgomery was making a real impression. Mrs. Montgomery was from New York, and just how wealthy and socially important she was at home everyone knew, and yet she mingled with the ladies quite as if she was one of them. And not only that, but she had ideas. Her manner of arranging the apron table, as she had once arranged one for the actor's fair, was enough to show she was no common person. Already her ideas had quite changed the old cut and dried arrangements. At her request, ladies were constantly running out to buy rolls of crepe paper and other inexpensive decorative accessories, and the dull gray room was blossoming into a fairy garden. And when you come tonight, I want each of you to wear a huge bow of crepe paper in your hair. And what have you there, Jane? Mrs. Montgomery, although beyond her fortieth year, had the fresh and youthfully bright face of a girl of eighteen. She was one of those splendidly large women who retain a vivid interest in life and all its details. And Mrs. Van Dyne, who was smaller and lesser in every way, was her Riverbank counterpart. "'Nothing much,' Mrs. Van Dyne answered, dipping her hand into the sack. "'But it was kind of the man to send what he could. Wooden spoons, I suppose.' "'Well, will you look at this, Anna?' It was one of the funny cats. Mrs. Van Dyne held it up that all the ladies might see. "'How perfectly ridiculous!' exclaimed Mrs. Wilcox. What do you suppose it was meant to be? Do you suppose it is a bear? Or an otter or something? asked Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, I know. It's a squirrel. Did you ever see anything so, so ridiculous? The ladies, all except Mrs. Montgomery, 
laughed gleefully at the funny cat Buddy had hugged and loved. "'We might get a dime for it anyway, Alice,' said one. "'Are there any more? They will help fill the toy table. Do you think they would spoil the toy table, Mrs. Montgomery?' The New Yorker had taken the cat in her hand, and Mrs. Van Dyne was standing one after another of Peter's toys on the table. "'Spoil it!' exclaimed Mrs. Montgomery enthusiastically. "'I have not seen anything so naive since I was in Russia. It is like the Russian peasant toys, but different, too. It has a character of its own. Oh, how charming!' She had seized another of the funny animals. "'But what is it?' asked Mrs. Wilcox. "'Mercy! I don't know what it is,' laughed Mrs. Montgomery. "'But what does that matter? You can call it a cat. It looks something like a cat. Yes, I'm sure it is a cat. Or a squirrel. That doesn't matter. Can't you see that no one but a master impressionist could have done them?' Just see how he has done it with a dozen quick turns of his, his... Jackknife, Mrs. Van Dyne supplied. Do you think they are worth anything, Alice? Worth anything? exclaimed Mrs. Montgomery. My dear, they are worth anything you want to ask for them. Really, they are little masterpieces. Can't you see how refreshing they are, after all the painted and prim toys we see in the shops? Just look at this funny frog, or whatever it is. The ladies all laughed. You see, said Mrs. Montgomery, you can't help laughing at it. The man that made it has humor, and he has art, and, and untrammeled vision, and really the most wonderful technique. Peter Lane and the Technique of a Jackknife The ladies of the Baptist Aid Society were too surprised to gasp. The enthusiasm of Mrs. Montgomery took their breath away, and Mrs. Montgomery was not loath to speak still more, with the discoverer's natural pride in her discovery. She examined one toy after another, and her enthusiasm grew and infected the other women. They, too, began to see the charm of Peter's handiwork, and to glimpse what Mrs. Montgomery had seen clearly, that the toys were the result of a frank, humorous, boyish imagination, combined with a man's masterly sureness of touch. Here was no jigsaw, paper-patterned, conventional, German or French slop-shop toy, daubed over with ill-smelling paint. She tried to tell the ladies this, and being in New York the president of several important art and literary and musical societies, she succeeded. "'We must ask twenty-five cents apiece for them,' said Mrs. Ferguson. "'Oh, twenty-five cents! A dollar at least,' said Mrs. Montgomery. "'The work of an artist! Don't you see it is not the intrinsic value, but the art the people will pay for?' "'But do you think Riverbank will pay a dollar for art?' asked Mrs. Van Dyne. Mrs. Montgomery glanced over the toys. "'I will pay a dollar apiece for all of them and be glad to get them,' she said. "'I feel, I feel as if this alone made my trip to Riverbank worth while. You have no idea what it will mean to go home and take with me anything so new and unconventional.' I shall be famous, I assure you, as the discoverer of— His name is Peter Lane, said Mrs. Van Dyne. He is one of the shanty boatmen that live on the river. A little, mildly blue-eyed man, a sort of hermit. They call him the jackknife man, because he whittles wooden spoons and peddles them. Oh, he will be a success, cried Mrs. Montgomery. Even his name is delicious. Peter Lane. Isn't it old-fashioned and charming? Peter Lane, the jackknife man. How many of these toys may I have, Anna? I want one, said Mrs. Wilcox promptly, and before the ladies were through, Mrs. Montgomery had to insist that she be permitted to claim two of the toys by her right as discoverer. 
Later, as they went homeward for supper, Mrs. Van Dyne gave a happy little laugh. "'That was splendid, Alice,' she said, "'to think you were able to make them pay a dollar apiece for those awful toys.' "'Awful!' exclaimed Mrs. Montgomery. "'My dear, I meant every word I said. You will see. Your Peter Lane is going to make me famous yet.' That evening, while Peter sat in his shanty boat, lonely and thinking of Buddy as he whittled a spoon, Mrs. Montgomery stood, tall and imposing and sweet-faced, behind the toy table on which all of Buddy's toys stood with sold tags strung on them, and told about Peter Lane, the jackknife man. "'I'm very sorry,' she said time after time, "'but they are all sold.' We do not know yet whether we can persuade the jackknife man to make duplicates, but we will take your order subject to his whim, if you wish. We cannot promise anything definite. Artists are so notably irresponsible. But there was one voice which, had Peter been able to hear it, would have set him making jackknife toys on the instant. While the ladies of the Baptist church were exclaiming over the toys in the Sunday school room, a small boy with freckles and white kinky hair was leaning on the knee of a harsh-faced woman in a white farmhouse three miles up the river road. "'Auntie Potter,' he said longingly, "'I wish Uncle Peter would come and make me a funny cat.' "'If he don't,' said Mrs. Potter with great vigor, "'he's a worthless scamp.'" End of chapter 16Chapter Seventeen of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen More Funny Cats. New York, being a great mill that grinds off rough corners and operates, as it seems, for no other purpose than to make each New York inhabitant and each New York creation a facsimile of every other New York inhabitant and creation loves those who introduce the quaint, the strange, and the outlandish, which is to say anything not after the conventional New York model. Women have become rich with the discovery of a rag rug or a cornhusk doormat. To Mrs. Montgomery, the trip to Peter Lane's shanty boat was a path to fame. Her quick perception grasped every detail and saw its value, or, to put it most crudely, its advertising potency. As she, with Mr. and Mrs. Van Dyne, whirled down the smooth bluff road in the Van Dyne barouche, she said, "'Anna, I do wish we could have come in an ox-cart, or a straddle little donkeys, or in a hay-wagon at least.' "'My dear, isn't this comfortable enough?' "'Oh, I was thinking of my talk before the Arts and Crafts Club. It makes such a difference.' It is so conventionable to be taken in a carriage. And probably I'll find your Peter Lane just an ordinary man, and his shanty boat nothing but a common houseboat. But when the carriage ran into the farmer's yard, it was Sunday, and the farmer volunteered to show the route to Peter's shanty boat, and warned Mrs. Montgomery, after a glance at her handsome furs, that it would be a rough tramp, her spirits rose again. Perhaps there would be some local color after all. The event fully satisfied her. In single file they tramped the long path to the boat, stooping under low boughs, climbing over fallen tree trunks, dipping into hollows. Rabbits turned and stared at them and scurried away. Great grapevine swings hung from the water elms, and when the broad expanse of Big Tree Lake came into view, Mrs. Montgomery stood still and absorbed the scene. It represented absolute loneliness, acres of waving rice straw, acres of snow-covered ice, and, closing under the bank, the low squat shantyboat overshadowed by the leafless willows. It was a romantic setting for her hermit. The farmer had brought them by the shorter route, so that they had to cross the lake 
and Peter, gathering driftwood, was amazed to see the procession issue from the rice and come toward him across the lake. "'That's Peter,' said the farmer. "'He acts like he don't expect company.' Peter was standing at the edge of the willows, his arms full of driftwood, the gray blanket serape with its brilliant red stripes hanging to his ankles, and a homemade blanket cap pulled down over his ears. He stood like a statue until they reached him, then doffed his cap politely, and Mrs. Montgomery saw his eyes and knew this was the artist. "'I guess you'd better step inside my boat, if it's big enough,' said Peter. "'But it's sort of mussy. Maybe you'd like to wait out here till I sweep out. I've been whittling all morning.' "'We will go in just as it is,' said Mrs. Montgomery promptly. I want to see where you work, just as it is when you work. Peter looked at her with surprise. "'You ain't mistook in the man you're looking for, are you, ma'am?' he asked. "'I'm Peter Lane. I don't work in this boat. Lately I've been working up at the farmer's, sawing wood.' Mrs. Montgomery laughed delightedly, and Peter, looking into her eyes, grinned. He liked this large, wholesome woman. "'You are the man,' said Mrs. Montgomery, gaily. "'And since Mrs. Van Dyne won't introduce me, I'll introduce myself.' Peter was justified in his doubts regarding the capacity of his boat, and the farmer, after trying to feel comfortable inside, went out and sat on the edge of the deck. The shavings on the floor, the wooden spoons, there were but three or four, the boat itself, when she learned Peter had built it himself, all delighted her. She asked innumerable questions that would have been impertinent but for her kindly smile, and she was delighted when she learned that Peter had but one blanket, which was his coat by day and his bedclothing by night. But more than all else she liked Peter's kindly eyes. She explained in detail the object of their visit, and Peter listened politely. "'It's right kind of you to come down so far,' he said when he had heard. "'But I guess I'll have to refuse you, Mrs. Montgomery. I don't seem to have no desire to make no more funny toys. I guess I won't.' "'I can understand the feeling perfectly,' said Mrs. Montgomery, too wise to try coaxing. "'You haven't an artist's reluctance to undertake for pay what you have done for pleasure only.' "'It ain't that,' said Peter. "'I just whittled out them toys for a little feller I had here, because he used to laugh at them. "'That's all I'd done it for, and since he ain't here to laugh, it don't seem as if I could get the grin into them. "'I don't know as I can explain. "'I don't know as you could consider if I did.' "'But I do, I do,' said Mrs. Montgomery eagerly. You mean you lack the sympathetic audience. Maybe so, said Peter doubtfully. But what I do mean is that I'd miss the look in his eyes and how he quicked up his mouth whilst I was cutting out a toy. Maybe it looks to you like this hand and this old wetted-down jackknife was what made them toys, but that ain't so. No, ma'am. All I'd done was to take a piece of maple wood and start things going. This is going to be a cat, buddy, I'd say, maybe, and he'd sparkle up at me and say, A funny old cat, Uncle Peter. And then it had got to be a funny old cat, like he said. And his eyes and his mouth would tell me just how funny to make that cat, and just how funny not to make it. He sort of seen each whittle before I seen it myself, and told me how to make it by the look of his eyes and the way his mouth sort of felt for it, until I got it just right. And then he would laugh. So, you see, now the buddy's gone, I couldn't. No, I guess I couldn't. And you made no more after Buddy, after he left? He didn't die said Peter, if that's what you mean. He was took away. Yes'm. I did make a couple. I made a couple more cats to put in the gunny sack. 
but that was because I sort of saw Buddy a sitting there on the floor, even when he was gone. But don't you see, cried Mrs. Montgomery eagerly, that you can always see Buddy? Don't you know there are hundreds of other Buddies, boys and girls, all over the country, and that as you work, a man of your imagination can feel their eyes and smiling mouths guiding your hand and your knife? They want your funny cats, too, Mr. Lane. Don't you see that you could sit here in your lonely boat and have all the children of America clustered about your knee? Yes, I do sort of see it, said Peter. But it's a thing I'm liable to forget any time. But you must not forget it, exclaimed Mrs. Montgomery. Your work is too rare, too valuable to permit you to forget. How many artists do you suppose are like the musicians, able to draw their inspiration face to face from their audiences? Very few, Mr. Lane. Do you suppose a Dickens was able to have those for whom he wrote crowded in his workroom? And yet those he worked to please guided his pen. He heard the laughs and saw the tears, and was guided by them as he chose the words that were to cause the laughs and tears. You, too, can see the children's faces. She paused, for she saw in Peter's eyes that he understood and agreed. But then there's another reason I can't whittle more toys, he said. I've got about thirty more cords of wood to saw this winter. But that is not like you, said Mrs. Montgomery, reproachfully. You see, I know you, Mr. Lane. You are not the man to saw wood when all the buddies are eager for your toys. It ain't like me usually, admitted Peter. I don't know who's been telling you about me, but usually I don't do any work I don't have to, and that's a fact. But certain circumstances... He hesitated. You didn't know why they took Buddy away from me, did you? I wasn't fit to keep him. I was like a certain woman was always telling me, I guess, shiftless and no account. So they took Buddy. And I guess they were right. But I've changed. It's going to take some time, but I'm going to make money, and I'm going to be like other folks, and I'm going to get Buddy back. So, you see, he said after this outburst, I've got to saw wood. If it wasn't for that... I'd be right eager to make toys for all the kids you speak of. It would be a pleasure, but I've got to make some money." Mrs. Montgomery stared at him. "'You don't mean to tell me,' she began, "'you don't mean to say you thought I wanted you to give up everything and make toys for nothing?' "'Why, yes,' said Peter. "'But, my dear Mr. Lane!' exclaimed Mrs. Montgomery. I do believe I almost persuaded you to do it. She laughed joyously. Oh, you are a true artist. Why, you can make many, many times as much money whittling jackknife toys as you could make sawing wood. You can hire your own wood sawed. She descended to details and told him what he could sell the toys for, how she would tell of them in New York and interest a few dealers. "'You'll be working for Buddy all the while you are working for the other Buddies,' she ended, "'making the home you want while you make the toys that will make little children happy.' "'That's so,' agreed Peter eagerly, and her battle was won. The rest was mere detail. Her address in New York, prices, samples, Peter's address, and other similar matters. The farmer was willing enough to hunt another man to saw his wood. Mrs. Van Dyne placed the orders with which she had been commissioned by the Baptist ladies. Mr. Van Dyne, the cashier of the First National Bank, actually shook Peter's hand in farewell, and Peter was alone again. When the voices of his visitors had died in the distance, he lifted the mattress of his bunk and felt under it with his hand until he found a round, soft ball. He unrolled it and smoothed it out. Buddy's old worn stockings, 
out at knees and toes. "'There now,' he said, hanging them on a nail under his clock shelf. "'I guess I ain't afraid to have you look me in the face now.' "'What happened to the child he mentioned?' Mrs. Montgomery asked, when she was snugly rug and wrapped in the barouche once more. "'I think some society took it,' Mrs. Van Dyne answered. "'I'll have Jim look it up. No doubt Jim can have the boy return to Peter Lane.' "'I'll do what I can,' said Mr. Van Dyne. But Mrs. Montgomery was silent while the carriage traveled a full mile. "'I wouldn't,' she said at last. No, I wouldn't. You might see that the boy is where he is properly cared for, but I think it will be best to let the jackknife man earn the boy himself. I know what he has been, and I can see what he hopes to be. If he could step outside himself and see as we see, he would say what I say. The best thing for him is to have something to work for. He could work for money like the rest of us, suggested Mr. Van Dyne. "'Oh, you utter Philistine!' cried Mrs. Montgomery. "'You must wait until he gets the habit, and then—' "'Then what?' "'Then he will have a bank book,' laughed Mrs. Montgomery. The winter passed rapidly enough for Peter. Between the stockings and the vision of the children Mrs. Montgomery had conjured up, and his eagerness to win a home for Buddy— Peter worked as faithfully as an artist should, and he made many raids on the farmer's woodpile to secure dry, well-seasoned maple wood. When the vision of Buddy's eyes grew dim, Peter was always able to bring it back by humming Bouge's song, and before the winter was over, Peter had crowded his clock shelf with toys and had constructed another shelf, which was filling rapidly, for while he made many duplicates, he kept one of each for Buddy. Buddy's menagerie, he called them. Thus he kept his own interest alive, too, for when it flagged he made a new animal, making it as he thought Buddy would like it made, and so that it would bring that happy, Ho, ho, that's a funny old squirrel, Uncle Peter. One letter Peter wrote, soon after the visit to his boat, which was to Mrs. Van Dyne. It brought this answer. My husband called at the place you mentioned, but the little girl is there no longer. I can find no trace of her. Mr. Briggles, I understand, has had to leave this state, and no one knows where he is. Peter had no time to go to town. Mrs. Montgomery had been as good as her word, and had, on her return to New York in mid-season, introduced the Peter Lane jackknife toys to her arts and crafts club, and to two of those small shops on the avenue that seem so inconspicuous and yet are known to everyone. The toys, after their first few weeks as a fashionable fad, settled into a vogue, and James Van Dyne, whom Mrs. Montgomery had wisely asked to act as Peter's agent, received letters from other shops and from wholesalers asking for them. The toys were, of course, almost immediately counterfeited by other dealers, and it was Van Dyne who wisely secured copyrights on Peter's models, and who, later in the winter, sent Peter a small branding iron with which he could burn his autograph on each toy. Peter's farmer friend stopped at the bank on each trip to town, delivering the toys, which Van Dyne tagged and turned over to the express company. The farmer brought back such supplies as Peter had commissioned him to buy. The entire business was crude and unsystematic, even to Peter's method of packing the toys in hay and sewing the parcels in gunny sacking. But it all served. It was naive. When the ice in the river went out, and that in Big Tree Lake softened and honeycombed, Peter put aside his jackknife for a few days and repaired the old duck blind that had been Bouge's damp and temporary home, and built two more, knowing George Rapp and his friends would be down before long. He built two more bunks in the narrow shanty boat, 
and cleared a tent space on the highest ground near the boat, constructing a platform four feet above the ground, in case the high water should come with the ducks. All this put a temporary close to his toy-making, but Peter was ready for rap when the first flock of ducks dropped into the lake, and that night he sent the farmer's hired man to town with a message to rap. Late the next evening, Rapp and his two friends found Peter waiting for them at the road, and the best part of the night was spent getting the provisions and duck boats to the slough. The four men dropped asleep the instant they touched their beds, and it was not until the next morning, when Peter was cooking breakfast, that he had an opportunity to ask a question that had been in his mind. "'George,' he said, "'you didn't ever hear where they took Buddy to, did you?' Rapp looked up and stared at Peter until the match with which he had been lighting his pipe burned his fingers, and he snapped them with pain. "'Do you mean to tell me you don't know where that boy is?' he asked. "'Well, I'll be petered. Why, Mrs. Potter's got him.' Peter was holding a plate, but he was quick, and he caught it before it struck the floor. "'I—I I caught that one.' he said in silly fashion. "'You're going to catch something else when Widow Potter sees you,' said George Rapp. End of chapter 17